So he's, uh, Dr. Shishong served as the main surgeon in Limbe, a semi-rural town of Southwest Cameroon, uh, where he occupied the position of Chief of Service of Surgery for 11 years, uh, from 2005 to 2015. In 2006, he was called to serve as a part-time lecturer in anatomy and general surgery in the Faculty of Health Sciences of the University of Boya, and became a full-time lecturer in the same faculty in 2009. He was promoted to the rank of senior lecturer in 2010 and became professor in 2014. After returning from Paris, uh, Paris, France, where he successfully presented uh, the competitive examination to become a university professor. He was appointed as the head department of surgery in faculty of health sciences, University of Boya in 2011, a position he still holds to date. Professor Shishom uh, serves as a co-director of the program for the advancement of surgical equity uh, based at UCLA. Uh, Professor Shishom also served as the medical director from 2015 to 2017 and director of training, research, and innovation from 2018 to 2020 at the uh, Ginaco Obstetric and a Pediatric Hospital, a level one uh, institution located in Douala in Cameroon. As a researcher, Professor Shishom has published over 85 original re research papers in world-renowned peer-reviewed journals. He is a reviewer for numerous medical journals, such as the World Journal of Surgery, World Journal of Emergency Surgery, Injury, Traffic, Injury Prevention, PLOS One, uh, uh, World Journal of Gastroenterology, South African Medical Journal, Nigerian Journal of Surgery, and more. His research activities are currently oriented towards improving outcome of management of the injured, antimicrobial resistance stewardship, and global surgical equity. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shisham. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine if someone could speak about me more than I would have done it myself. So it's amazing. Thanks so much. I didn't know you knew me that well. Uh, Kevin has told you everything uh, about me. Um, um, I feel really honored uh, being invited to discuss with medical students from uh, LA. That's actually what I do from morning to evening. And actually, uh, I think I'm privileged to have the opportunity to speak uh, with medical students who are trained in a completely uh, different environment like uh, in the United States of America. Uh, so the idea is to get you into what I do on a daily basis, what I've been doing for the past 10 years. That is trying uh, to see how we can reduce the burden of trauma and injuries uh, in Cameroon. If you don't mind, uh, I will share my screen uh, right now, uh, can someone confirm that you can see my screen? I can see it. Yeah. Great. So uh, I've been working with a number of partners, uh, specifically from California, uh, on developing strategies to reduce the burden of injuries uh, in Cameroon. Uh, Actually, I stay in Cameroon. Uh, I work in uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences of a, a university, the university of a city called Boya, uh, that's in Cameroon. Uh, it took me a long time to make a decision on what would be the best formula discussing with you guys. Uh, I hesitated between just having a free talk, general talk, or having a presentation like the one I'm sharing uh, with you right now. Uh, what uh, influenced my final decision was uh, actually this. I wanted, I thought it was important I show you this. What you are seeing is here is uh, the volcanic eruption of Mount Cameroon. Mount Cameroon, my university is just at the foot of this mountain. And what you see here is what happened in 2001, that's just 20 years back. Uh, it actually happened again in 2010. It tends to happen once every 10 years. So it's an active uh, volcano and it is worth uh, following the example of Kevin and deciding to come and visit Cameroon. Because if you come, I'm going to take you to Mount uh, Cameroon. And if uh, you are interested in sports, when there is no eruption there, uh, it's an interesting place for sports because once every year we organize a race 
of that mountain. And it's a major sporting event, uh, sportive event with people coming from all over the world, including uh, United States of America, because it's really, uh, really challenging. Uh, the only problem I have with that is if you decide to come, you better get, uh, avoid getting injured while you are in Cameroon because that's going to be a completely uh, different challenge. If you get injured in Cameroon, uh, uh, I hope I'm not scaring anyone with this kind of images that I'm displaying right now. Uh, I'm dealing with medical students, so uh, I think it should be okay and I will remove it as soon as possible. This is the problem. I have a friend who is in uh, Seattle called Charlie Mock, uh, a great guy. He demonstrated some year back that if you get injured in Cameroon with this kind of injury, if it's in the States, you're fine. You are likely to be, to, 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 to be uh, rescued and properly saved and get back to your full life uh, uh, sometime after. But if this happens to you while in Cameroon, you are twice as likely to die uh, than if you were in the United States of America. So this is a big uh, challenge, and this is why uh, you probably uh, avoid getting injured in Cameroon. So why this difference between uh, United States and other high-income countries uh, and Cameroon? This is uh, what would likely happen uh, in the United States of America. First of all, your situation will be handled early from the pre-hospital uh, side. That is, people will start attending to you before you even get to the hospital. You, get, you know about the paramedics. Uh, it's going to be a, a call to a call center. An ambulance will be mobilized immediately with sensitized and trained uh, officers, including police officers, uh, trained staff in the ambulance. They will come to you. Uh, and this will, is going to take an average of six minutes if you are in Washington, D.C., for example. I don't know what it's going to be in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles exactly. But if you're in Washington, D.C., the time between uh, when you get injured and when the ambulance takes you to the hospital is an average of six minutes. Uh, I like telling my friends who come to visit Cameroon that uh, if you get injured in the parking lot of the hospital in, uh, in Limbe, where I am, it's probably going to take more than six minutes to get you to the emergency room <laughs> of my hospital. Uh, now, once you get in the hospital, the hospital in U.S. are well equipped, uh, the guys working there who are trained staff are working on evidence-based guidelines, their uh, mechanism for triage. Uh, these services in the hospital are frequently audited to make sure that things are being done the right way. And if uh, the hospital where you are taking uh, to as a first line is not uh, up to the task in solving the problems that are identified in you, uh, there will be uh, a, a uh, I mean, they will have the possibility of using a well-organized referral system with appropriate medicalized transport, with guidelines during transportation, with people who are trained. Uh, you're going to be moved to the next institution with specialized diagnostic or for specialized diagnostic, and you will have access uh, to specialized care there. Now, once you have been taken care of, you will have access to rehab, with appropriate appliances, with uh, appropriate access to occupational therapy, with physiotherapy, and uh, with other support in the form of work at home and these kind of things. And this is why uh, you guys achieve the excellent outcomes that you have there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe before I go any further, I need to tell you one word about what Cameroon is all about. Uh, I will use one or two aspects to compare Cameroon and the United States. We are here. Uh, if you know what the African continent looks like, Cameroon is here, just at the heart of the African uh, continent. We say it's in Central and West Africa. Uh, we are called what we, we, we are what they call a middle income country. That is the gross domestic product per capita is about 2,300 US dollars. Just to give you an idea, in the US it is 63,500. So you see what the difference is. It's a population of about 26 million people right now, according to the most recent uh, World Bank estimate. And while you guys in the US hope to live 78 years before you die, uh, in Cameroon, if you make it 59 years, it's not bad. You, you've done the, the best uh, from what the system uh, has to offer. 
Now, looking into health, the health system in Cameroon is not completely desperate. The health system is stratified in five levels from the health center to the level one institution, which is the reference hospital. And Kevin just told you that I was lucky enough to serve as a medical director in uh, such a level one institution. Uh, now, uh, in terms of organization of health, the healthcare system, major public health problem uh, and issues are coordinated by specific programs at the central, uh, central level. That is at the level of the Ministry of Public Health of Cameroon. Uh, such examples will include tuberculosis, uh, HIV and AIDS uh, related issues or malaria. But we don't have any such program in Cameroon uh, when it comes to the care of the injured, which means that clearly uh, the problem of injury in Cameroon is not well understood uh, by those who are in charge of uh, public uh, policy. Uh, another striking issue, one of the reasons why you will likely die of an open fracture if it happens in Cameroon is that we don't care here if you've got a billion US dollars in a bank account. If you get in the hospital here, we want you to pay and we want you to pay in full and in cash. We don't take credit cards, we don't take checks. You must pay in cash, even if you have a billion dollars in US bank, we're not going to, uh, to, to trust you for that, except for what we call here immediately life or limb threatening emergency. So absence of health coverage. I, I know uh, you still have uh, that kind of issues uh, in the US as well. I, I know about that. I've been in New York for <laughs> some health issues not too long ago, and I know what it sounds like. Uh, uh, I know you have been discussing about the Obamacare and, and, and all these things so that you have uh, a greater proportion of the population in, the Amer in, the, in America who have access to the minimum uh, health care coverage. But in Cameroon, it's really scary what is, uh, what is happening. Now, let me tell you why we are concerned about injury in Cameroon. Uh, this is a very special country, and I really invite you to, to come here if you have the opportunity to do so, because this is probably one of the rare countries in the world where you can get injured while sleeping in your bed. A car will come and meet you up there. Uh, this also happens in the U.S., but it's uh, kind of uh, quite rare. Uh, what never happens in the U.S. is this kind of traffic light which can be green and red at the same time. And imagine the kind of confusion that is likely uh, to cause. So welcome to Cameroon. Uh, globally, globally, injuries kill about 5.8 million people every year in the world. Uh, I don't know what uh, state in America we can compare this to. So it's actually about wiping the entire population of a country somewhere in the world every year just to give you an idea of what it is all about. It accounts for 16% of the global burden of disease uh, uh, in the world. And now, if you look into the number of people in the world who are currently living with a disability related to injury, it's about 650 million uh, people. That's it in general. What makes it more of a concern for people like me is that 90% of these cases of injury actually occur in county like the one where I live right now, 90%. And 80% of the 650 million disabled that I was telling you about live here in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in India, and in a number of uh, uh, low uh, resource uh, countries. And I don't want to tell you about the consequences in terms of economic outcomes and, and all of this. I told you a little bit earlier that the Ministry of Health in Cameroon cares about HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and this, this types of problem. I am dying trying to make them understand that injuries alone kill more than these three conditions combined. These three conditions kill 4,200,000 people every year while injury alone in the world kills 5,800,000 people. This is a fact established by uh, WHO. Now, uh, if you come back more closer to us, Sub-Saharan Africa where I live, 78 million people with disability. I told you we're having about 400 million people all around the world 
I, I, I almost said, luckily, uh, most of them are in Asia, Pacific, and all of this area, but still, we have 78 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa living with a disability. What is really scary about it is the projection. If nothing is done now, right now, it's likely going to be 125 million people by 2035, which is scary. It's a projection from uh, UNDP. Uh, what happens in uh, countries like Cameroon, uh, it's actually, I'm going to tell you about it. Most of it is on the road. It happens most often on the road. Uh, I know that uh, there are lots of issues in USA about the road as well, uh, but uh, in Cameroon, it's going to be worse than that. Uh, why do I say it was? Actually, you guys uh, in uh, Western countries own 89% of automobiles, 89%. Yet, you guys suffer only 24% of road-related injuries. We have only 11% of cars, and with that, we can achieve 76% of all death-related to, to traffic, which is something really uh, weird uh, to say the least. So much uh, burden of injury related death, disability can actually be, and this has been demonstrated by you guys in the US and by other developed country. I'm going to tell you about the example of Canada, uh, which I get inspiration from. This can really be uh, decreased, this burden can be decreased by establishing preventive measure and combining them with a surveillance system and also by improving the care of the injured. So based on the experience that I had in uh, Limbe Hospital, I felt like it's time for us in low and middle income countries to start taking uh, our responsibilities. At that time, uh, this is what the situation was uh, in Cameroon. I'm talking about 2008. It is the, the, the year when I met this amazing lady. Some of you probably know her already. Uh, you might, some of you will definitely discover her because she's going to tell you uh, about, uh, she's going to, uh, to give you some uh, teaching about injuries uh, in uh, UCLA. Uh, it's Dr. Catherine Juliet, my amazing friend. Uh, she looks uh, rather small, but she proved to me that usually she is not about size, <laughs> but it's about knowledge and wisdom. And that's what a leader uh, is, is, is all about. Uh, and I learned a lot from her and uh, I, I really still enjoy uh, collaborating with her, we both realized that there were almost no data in Cameroon estimating the global magnitude of the problem. So someone had to take the lead and we felt like th this was the time for us to take the lead. I instituted in Limbe, the city where I was practicing at that time, a manual trauma registry. That's really manual trauma re registry which permitted me to start recording baseline information on injuries and demonstrate how reliable it was to report uh, injury cases using a systematic and organized uh, system. Uh, this gave us a first idea and actually Dr. Juliet inspired a similar uh, project in the Yaoundé, the capital city uh, of Cameroon. This got, gave us a first idea of injury epidemiology and pattern severity of injury in Cameroon. I was in Limbe, she was in Yaoundé. We published the findings of what we discovered. From that time, we knew it was mostly happening on the road, 36% in Limbe, almost 60% in, uh, in Yaoundé. But also, just like in the United States, we have issues with violence, uh, in particular interpersonal uh, violence. I know it's not the same pattern because in the US it's a lot about uh, gun and uh, fire weapons and these kind of things. Uh, for now in Cameroon, we are still able to control fire weapons. Uh, so the pattern is a little bit different, but it's all about road and interpersonal uh, violence. Let me take you for a quick tour on the road in Cameroon. The road you see here is a road that connects the two largest cities in Cameroon, that is Yaoundé, the capital city, and Douala, uh, considered as the economic capital in Cameroon. So it's a road uh, of uh, 280 uh, kilometers, with sometimes, uh, like in this area, you see an area where you can see as far as four kilometers ahead. Yes, the road sometimes get cut, uh, just like now, and the traffic is completely interrupted. But apart from uh, long lines like this, when you see from far, uh, you have this kind of situations where there are bends, trucks moving, 
uh, forget about uh, the eight lanes roads that you have in the United States, uh, which are divided. Uh, you never meet someone who is coming the opposite direction. No, it doesn't work uh, like that here in Cameroon. This is the road. These people are moving from Yaoundé to Douala. Then you have people who drive on this lane who are moving from Douala to Yaoundé, the opposite side. When you have trucks like this driving slowly, you get quickly tempted and, and uh, uh, starting a dangerous overtaking. And this is how it ends with you. Uh, you find yourself under a truck uh, like this one. Uh, this is the only road in the world when you will see a sign uh, indicating a bend to the left while the bend is actually to the right. Oops, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's only the only road in the world uh, once uh, described as one of the most dangerous roads in the world uh, by a publication of one of my peers, because it's the only road where you will see this kind of crazy situation. It's a bend. On the right here, you see signs telling people that people once died, recently died here from a traffic uh, injury. And this guy is overtaking a truck on that bend, and the other crazy guy is overtaking the guy who's already overtaking. You, you will never have such a situation in the United States. And that's uh, uh, actually explained uh, why uh, in Cameroon we sometimes have this kind of cataclysmic situation on the road where uh, uh, public transport uh, cars get involved with uh, dozens of people who die. Uh, recently we moved also into uh, rail, railway, railroad uh, injury related situations with uh, hundreds of victims on the spot. We're now involved in terror related uh, activities. And, and I was telling you about violence. Actually, this guy is not from Cameroon, he's a guy from South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, considered as one of the most violent uh, cities in the world. So these are uh, the mechanism of injuries that we notice in Cameroon. Now, why did we think it was necessary to start a systematic recording of data uh, related to injuries in Cameroon? We realized that with the existing administrative recording system, recording system uh, that was in place, uh, as many as 77% of patients did not have a blood pressure recorded when they get into the emergency uh, room in Limbe. Nobody cared at all about taking what their respiratory rate was. Uh, uh, elements like Glasgow Coma Scale or Injury Severity Score were never any concern for anyone. And we thought it was really time for us to, uh, to start uh, uh, taking actions in having some basic uh, data on, how, on what is happening in, in Cameroon. So the first action we took was the manual registries. In, in no time we recorded uh, 3,000 entries in that registry in Yaoundé, more than 5,500 uh, in Limbe after just uh, four years of this purely manual uh, registry and we published this data. Look at what happened in Limbe after instituting uh, a manual registry. We could get Glasgow Coma Scale miss only in 8% of patients. We, we came down from 92% to 8% of patients. We still had 29% of, of patients for whom uh, blood pressure was not recorded. And this is most of the times related to the fact that uh, the blood pressure machine is not available in the emergency department. Yes, this is uh, possible in Cameroon. In Yaoundé, it was even better, by far better <coughs> than what they had before. You might wonder why we still have this proportion of patients with respiratory rates not recorded. This is because the registry was manual. No way you could force someone to go and get the respiratory rate and have it recorded. So after some time, we were able to uh, raise some funds and we know now move to an electronic data registry with uh, electronic uh, trauma registry with data hosted by the red cap system there in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, and we were able to have this project start in four different hospitals in Cameroon, including uh, Regional Hospital of Limbe, where I was, and three other sites in Cameroon. We launched an electronic tunnel registry with the data system where you cannot validate a data entry if all the data are not there. So you now must systematically have respiratory rate before you can validate the case that 
uh, you were just uh, able to uh, enter. And based on that, we now have basic data uh, about injuries in Cameroon. We've recorded about uh, over 20,000 entries in the electronic trauma uh, registry in Cameroon. We now know that most people who get injured are aged between 21 and 50 years, mostly males, 70% of males. So we now know we're dealing with the most active uh, proportion of the population in Cameroon. Uh, the truth about Cameroon and Sub-Saharan Africa in general is that males are still the main bread breadwinners for households uh, in Cameroon. You will never see a situation like uh, what happens in the States where the uh, partner in the household who earns more is privileged. So a man can stay at home to take care of the family. That doesn't exist in Cameroon or almost none. The males are the, still the breadwinner. So injuries are actually uh, devastating for those uh, who are considered the breadwinners uh, in Cameroon. We know it still happens in the road, but we also know there are a, num a number of what we call non-road uh, uh, traffic injury, non-fall blunt force. This is what uh, I was telling you about uh, uh, concerning intentional injuries, and I will tell you about the intent. So everything is still happening in the street, in the highway, and in the road. And we have issues uh, like uh, things that will never happen in, uh, or hardly happen in the United States, because you know that if you get drunk and you drive, you're probably going to end up in jail in the US. Here you, drive, you are drunk and you drive and nobody seems to care about it. Uh, in Cameroon, a car that is expected to carry four people can carry up to eight without anyone being uh, concerned uh, about it. Now, the main phenomenon that we had in Cameroon is that it's not about you driving in your tourist car to work and getting involved in the traffic issue. It's about motorcycle. People use motorcycle here a lot. Uh, Kevin can, test it, I can tell you about that in Douala, in a city like Douala, it's crazy. Uh, so motorcycles, uh, pedestrians, and other uh, uh, group which are often referred to as vulnerable road users are uh, the first people who suffer the burden of uh, injuries in Cameroon. Now, uh, forget about helmet uses, uh, about seatbelt in Cameroon, uh, motorcycles, only 3% of them use a helmet. Uh, I systematically use a seatbelt, but I'm considered a curiosity here uh, in Limbe. People don't think it, it helps in, in any way. And actually, I was like them until I visited New York and stayed there for a couple of months and realized nobody was moving without uh, a seatbelt. Uh, cars don't usually have seatbelt and other protective uh, mechanisms. And when they are, they don't deploy uh, in the case of uh, an incident. Uh, injuries, we know now know what proportion of injuries are unintentional and what proportion are actually intentional, over often in, uh, involving friends and acquaintances. Now, uh, this is what I was telling you about at the beginning. Only 14% of people receive any care uh, before the hospital. I'm not even talking about meaningful care. I mean, any type of care, usually provided by bystanders or by the person who is considered responsible for causing uh, the accident on the road. And what is it that they can do? They can usually control the breathing by applying pressure or they can reduce and immobilize a fracture based on empiric uh, knowledge. Sometimes they can place you in a recovery position. They like to place tourniquets here to control the bleeding. And medically, we are unsure whether uh, that is always a good option, especially if we can't know when we're going to, uh, to remove them. Uh, now, uh, transportation to the hospital is almost never by an ambulance. It's by a taxi or a motorcycle uh, and these kind of things. Uh, once uh, people get in the hospital, it's usually a, a, a district hospital. And uh, uh, actually, uh, once they get in the hospital, we realize that we have lots of issues with bleedings. The proportions of people who come into the hospital with an issue related to bleeding is over 65%. Uh, now you also have people who are no longer bleeding when they get into the hospital. They are transported to the hospital before we realize that, hey, this guy is no longer breathing uh, and these kind of things, but lots of respiratory uh, issues uh, when we get them in the hospital. Lots of issues, and you it makes sense if we are dealing with motorcycles, lot of issues with extremities, 
then it's going to be the face, then the head and neck. And actually we've been able to demonstrate over the past years that uh, almost 60% of those in die, who die as a consequence of injury in Cameroon die from head and brain involvement. But you also have a number of people with chest involvement and abdominal involvement. Pelvis is quite rare. Spine is also quite rare uh, here in Cameroon. Uh, we admit them in the emergency department and provide emergency care under the conditions that I told you about. No money, no care, except if you are no longer breathing. We'll get you back to breathing, and once you're there, we're going to ask you how you plan to pay <laughs> for your care. Uh, I'm not proud of this at all. Just describing what is happening in Cameroon with a cold uh, mind uh, completely. Luckily, Injuries most of the times are not too serious and more than 60% of people are discharged back home. Uh, those uh, whom are, who are not discharged back home sign that they want to go home and they don't want your admission or your care. And the reason obviously being that they probably can't pay. Now you have uh, uh, less than 15% uh, of people uh, for whom we, uh, we decide about uh, admission in the world. And a good proportion of people need to be transferred despite the absence of uh, an organized uh, transfer system uh, in, in Cameroon. And we have this issue about cost. Uh, how would I convert 18,000 CFA funds into US dollars? That should be about 20, $20. That's what people need to spend in the emergency department. And many of them don't have that uh, money. And it has been demonstrated that this is going to interfere uh, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, what is happening. But uh, I'm sorry to give you that kind of desperate situation. It's not completely hopeless. You see, this young boy uh, believes in his future. We believe in the future in, in Cameroon. Uh, I told you that I got my inspiration from the model of Canada. Look at what happened in Canada. What you have here in the Y uh, axis is the proportion of Canadian patients who died uh, following uh, what we call severe injury uh, in the 1990s, early 1990s. It was above 50%. Gradually over the year, they implemented a number of actions and we observed a gradual fall in the and I mean, it's, it's a, an amazing result that they achieved. They started by uh, uh, defining trauma care. I'm talking about trauma care as a priority. And this was a statement of the government of Quebec. From there, they started taking actions by uh, 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 designating some hospitals as level one trauma centers. They started introducing guidelines. It's all about guidelines that is providing the same uh, care to, the, uh, to people who are injured to the same extent. Then trauma became a priority in those level one centers in 1994, 1995. Then they started implementing triage and transfer protocols and they kept uh, uh, implementing measures until uh, they came to the point of having guidelines to decrease the dispatch to pre-hospital uh, uh, trauma and this kind of things. And based on measures, the result is amazing, which proved to me that making the care of the injured a priority yields results. You can change everything just by accepting that trauma is a priority and that you, are, you need to take actions on, on, uh, on curbing that. Uh, Kevin knows about our trauma quality improvement. Based on the findings, the data that we got from uh, the electronic, electronic trauma registry uh, in Cameroon, in our four pilot size, we designed a trauma quality improvement program. What was it all about? We decided that in these four uh, uh, hospitals, we're going to bring people together at least once every month for a trauma morbidity mortality conference. We tell you uh, much later during your, uh, the course of your studies what M&M &M conferences are all about. It's about sitting down together, looking into the file of trauma, people who were uh, uh, managed for trauma in the hospital to analyze everything that went wrong. The patient died or lost a limb or developed a complication. What is it that went wrong and how uh, can we avoid that happening next time? 
So uh, once every three months, uh, every uh, three months, yes, we brought everybody from the four institutions together with selected cases that they discuss in their M and M conferences in what we call in Cameroon the QI committee, uh, the trauma QI committee, and we discuss using uh, uh, an established uh, tool which uh, we call a root cause analysis to identify correctable deficiencies uh, in the system. In the process of establishing this QI committee in Cameroon, we trained four QI fellows and two QI program managers about uh, trauma-related research and analytic skills in QI methodologies. And we're now going to be able to use them to implement this kind of methods in other uh, places in Cameroon to move from the pilot centers where we are and implement it uh, elsewhere. elsewhere. Our idea was to apply these QI processes to refine the existing trauma uh, data collection tool. And I think we've been successful because I will tell you towards the end that we are uh, going to secure uh, more funds to get now to move from four pilot center to mega giga data. Uh, and I'm so excited about it. I will tell you in one minute uh, what it's all about. And we want to implement the QI committee meetings to propose appropriate trauma quality improvement interventions. We actually have a meeting, uh, and that's uh, an information for you, Kevin. Uh, with the Ministry of Public Health, we are trying to schedule a meeting so that we can deliver to them the findings of our QI quality, QI quality improvement program uh, in Cameroon so that they can make decisions on how they can make use of this to curb the uh, burden of injuries in Cameroon in general and improve uh, the management of injuries in Cameroon uh, uh, specifically. Another project we realized that uh, when patient gets into the hospital, I just told you uh, most of them get discharged. Uh, many of them against medical advice. They go home and uh, they don't come back to the hospital. Uh, and we came uh, to realize that uh, in Cameroon, uh, people don't have 18,000 CFA francs to pay for their care in the emergency department, but believe me or not, they all have an Android phone, which is worth uh, 50,000 CFA, that is $100. Uh, uh, some people, uh, you, you can believe me too, when uh, your industry delivers the, the most recent uh, iPhone or uh, whatever uh, brand uh, you might think about, the most recent, People in Cameroon get it before you guys there in USA, believe me or not. So we realize that nearly everybody in Cameroon has a cell phone with, uh, which is uh, what we call an Android phone. We decided to capitalize on this to follow up people who have been discharged from the hospital uh, in Cameroon uh, by giving them a call, uh, asking them how they are doing, uh, using a number of tools uh, to find out about what their situation at home is and identify those who might be in need of further care, invite them back to the hospital. And obviously, although they have a phone of $100, we will have to pay for their transportation to the hospital, but we are fine with that. We get them back to the hospital if they are in need of uh, a further physician examination. Then our physician examines them and uh, counsels them on what the, should be the next step in uh, their care and, uh, and how they can uh, get be better. We are in the process of completing uh, this other project uh, and we, we really hope that it's going to help us shift the follow-up of patients uh, who are victims of, in of injuries from the hospital to the community. Uh, and we are very excited uh, about this. We have been moving on, uh, on this now for the past uh, uh, two years. Now, just to summarize, I've been talking and talking for the past, I don't know how many minutes, uh, because I'm trying to convince that we're doing the best we can to control injuries uh, in Cameroon. There are two ways you can reduce the burden of injuries in Cameroon. The first one is by reducing the incidence. That's about prevention. That's about injury surveillance. And this is best done by community-based service. We did one in Cameroon and we were able to reach uh, over 8,000 uh, people in Cameroon. This gave us an idea of uh, what the burden of uh, injuries in the community in Cameroon is all about. But we don't have anything like a surveillance system uh, in Cameroon. Or 
uh, you have to combine these preventive measures with trauma care. You need to improve on trauma care. And this is what we attempted to do with the QI uh, quality improvement, uh, the quality improve, trauma quality improvement program. You must achieve this if you want to be efficient. Improving the care of the trauma must be pre-hospital, hospital, after discharge, and it must include rehab. Everything that is being done in Cameroon now in terms of care for the injured is done at the hospital level. That was the essence of it, trying to implement the cell phone follow-up program uh, that we successfully uh, implemented in Cameroon. And we hope to be able to share with you guys uh, results of uh, the, this uh, program uh, very soon. Uh, but uh, the good news about uh, everything we've been doing so far is that we've just secured uh, NI and NIH funding to start a data center in Cameroon. We are now, I'm so proud about it and so proud of uh, my uh, partner, Dr. Junior, about the amazing work that we were able to do. We're now going to shift from four pilot centers in Cameroon to 10 pilot centers, 10 centers. And we hope to be able from there to convince the Ministry of Public Health about the systematic collection of data everywhere and in every health institution in Cameroon using a trauma registry formula. We've got all the tools available for them. All it's all about is the decision. Now, from the data center that we will have now in the University of Boya, we're going to implement two uh, different sub programs, one of them about injury surveillance from all the aspects uh, of this and another one about patient follow-up uh, including uh, developing uh, an algorithm uh, and uh, artificial intelligence to predict outcomes of injuries in Cameroon. And that's what uh, we've been, we're working and we're preparing to start working about uh, in Cameroon. And all this is uh, to give these uh, people in Cameroon uh, more happiness. Actually, they don't need much uh, to be happy. I've been talking for long uh, and I think it's time I shut up and gives you guys the possibility of saying something about what you think of injuries in Cameroon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shisham. It's a very informative talk. Um, I'm, uh, Tracy, how, how, how much time do we have left of this discussion period? Yeah, we probably only have about five minutes for Q and A because um, because I think everybody has a lab that starts at eight o'clock, a, a class that starts at eight. Probably oh, five minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, do you want me to share the slide presentation with uh, with you guys there? Okay, great. I will email it to Tracy or uh, yes, immediately after this meeting. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Well, I just wanted to open up the floor to anyone who has any questions. I have a few prepared, but it seems like we only have just a couple minutes or a few minutes. So if anyone has any uh, questions that they're you know, dying to ask, then uh, go, go for it. You can raise your hand or just unmute your mic. Uh, not, not the physical hand, you got an electronic hand in the Zoom app. <laughs> Hi, uh, Kate Doble. I have a quick question, and I always struggle to figure out how to do the electronic hand. Very technolo <laughs> technologically challenged, even after two years of this. Um, I think you know, a lot of the challenges you're describing come down to resources and the prioritiza prioritization of injuries um, within the ministry and the global community. You talked about the... I was wondering if you have any thoughts on why the ministry and... Um, WHO seem to be prioritizing HIV, TB, malaria, even when you, the data clearly show injury is such an important contributor to mortality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know the reason. The reason is, there are two reasons to that. First, data. And then secondly, advocacy. There's nobody who is telling them, hey, Look, you are in, you are in a concern about uh, AIDS epidemic, malaria, epi but there is another, because actually epidemiologists consider the, the situation of injuries in uh, uh, low income countries as an epidemic. It is an epidemic the same way as HIV AIDS and it is a more serious epidemic. They don't know, nobody is telling them. So it's all about providing them with data, strong data, 
and providing them, I mean, having people who can advocate, talk to them and make them understand that, hey, uh, it's not about dropping the other issues, but it's about giving injuries the same level of priority as what you are giving to, to, to the other uh, issues. Great, thank you. And huge congratulations on your NIA grant for the data purpose, that's amazing. Thank you, thanks so much. Uh, there's been a there's been two questions in the chat. I just want to make sure that they were seen. Um, so the first one was, are there any opportunities for medical students like us to get involved? Is the main focus right now on data analysis? Yeah, absolutely. You only have a point. I think I'm uh, presently uh, working on uh, with a number of medical students. I don't know if any of them is on board right now. Uh, they are applying for global uh, scholarships for global uh, global health. Uh, I think if you talk to Kevin, he should be uh, able to advise you on what is the best way to go about it. But yes, there are opportunities for you to uh, work with us uh, with the possibility of working from where you are, or also the opportunity of coming to Cameroon uh, for an internship. We can organize it in a way that you get, you get one of your internship uh, in Cameroon. And I will be uh, more than happy to serve as a uh, as a supervisor if you decide uh, to follow that. But talk to Kevin. Don't hesitate to talk to uh, Dr. Julia as well. And I think Tracy also knows about that. So they, they will be there to guide you if you are interested. Uh, are you fascinated by the lava in Mount Cameroon? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I got to see that while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was there was one other question that I wanted to um, that was just in the chat as well. So I, I know uh, Dr. Chikom, you mentioned the incorrect street signs uh, that were you know causing a lot of confusion, potentially a lot of accidents. Um, so are there any initiatives to address the issues of infrastructure uh, like those like those street signs, for example? Yes, yes, uh, I depicted it uh, completely dark uh, intentionally, but uh, it's progressing every day. If you come to Cameroon now, you better watch because uh, you don't know where the radars are in Cameroon. Radars are manual and mobile, and the police guy uh, who is uh, holding it hides in the bush. You don't know when you've been flashed. You have absolutely no idea. All what is happening going to happen is that uh, we don't send you the fine uh, at your address, as it happens in the US. Uh, three or four kilometers after, someone is going to stop you on the road and ask you to pay a heavy fine immediately or immediately or get your car immobilized where you are. So th th there is progress everywhere on all aspects. Of, uh, even uh, uh, in the uh, road infrastructures, uh, in uh, hospital management, uh, we, we are far ahead of, uh, from what it was 10 years back. Uh, all I'm saying is that they are not doing enough, in my impression. The efforts uh, do not correlate with the importance of the problem of injuries in Cameroon. That's why I have a problem. And that's why we need advocacy. Uh, I just wanted to put out one more question before we wrap this up. Um, it seems that we've, you know, uh, over the last several years, we've had quite a fruitful partnership between uh, Cameroonian institutions, the University of Boya, yourself, and and UCLA. Um, what are you? What do you believe are the tenants that have made for you know a successful relationship? And what do you think? Um, uh, what values do you emphasize in these partnerships? Uh, I think, it, it, first of all, you need to know that we have uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, with the University of California, a, a full memorandum of understanding signed between the two institutions, University of Boya and University of California, and we can achieve a lot under the umbrella of uh, that memorandum. We've been focusing so far about two main things, that is research partnership, and I've achieved a lot with uh, Dr. Juliet. Uh, from the uh, University of California side, and also uh, exchange uh, of uh, students. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, what uh, permitted someone like Kevin to come to Cameroon. But I think we can achieve much more than that. We can push it to uh, all the aspects covered by the Memorandum of Understanding. And I think I'm going to share it with uh, Tracy so that she knows what areas that memo covers and what are the opportunities that they open, uh, especially for uh, medical students from UCLA.
Zach, we can see that you are moving. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Shum. Any uh, other words, uh, Tracy? Or no, I was I was just going to give a big thank you. This is the second time that I have had the pleasure of having you speak, Dr. Chichom, and every time I'm fired up and I I like I I want to like get involved with everything you're doing because I just feel your passion and your commitment to this and your advocacy and all of the things that that um, we want to inspire medical students with. So um, I, I've already talked to a lot of first year medical students this year and. There are, there are quite a few that are really inspired and wanting to get engaged with the work you're doing there. So I'm sure that you will hear from some of them that are on this call at some point in the near future. Thank you so much for doing this, especially on your Friday evening. We, we really, really appreciate it. I'm honored. I, I really was honored and I appreciated uh, exchanging with uh, all the amazing ladies and guys on board. Thanks so much for giving Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> A très bientôt. A bientôt. <laughs> A bientôt. Thank you so much. Bon weekend. Bye. bye. bye.